Good morning, everybody. It's good uh, to see you and that you all look healthy and well. Um, and uh, our, um, we're going to have uh, Vita do a presentation to us on uh, the Ag Long portfolio. Casey's uh, with us, the director. And, and uh, so welcome, Casey. And uh, we'll uh, let you kind of take over. And I think It'd be great to hear about, you know, the ag portfolios and, and uh, then we'll, we'll get into the broadband issue and maybe some of that stuff uh, a little bit after the ag issues. Okay. Well, thank you um, for inviting me this morning. Um, Senator Starr, as, as you said, I, um, I'm the, uh, manager of VIDA um, and president of VAC, which is the Vermont Agricultural Credit Corporation. And that's a uh, nonprofit corporation under the large umbrella of VIDA. Um, VIDA is involved in agricultural lending as well as commercial lending. And uh, today I'll focus on our agricultural portfolio and what we're seeing um, just to give you uh, some numbers, our entire loan portfolio, both commercial and agriculture is about 280 million. So um, small scale, certainly uh, relative to, you know, traditional commercial banks, we're about the size of a, a community bank. Uh, within that, um, about 40% of our portfolio is agriculture. And agriculture includes dairy and non-dairy, but dairy is a significant part of the agricultural portfolio. Um, about 60% of our ag portfolio is in dairy, um, and that translates to about $65 million in outstanding loans. Um, so as a Proportion to VITA as a whole, that represents um, somewhere between 20 and 25% of our entire uh, port loan portfolio is in the dairy sector. Um, our typical farms for dairy are in the small to medium range. We um, are not really there to serve um, a significant portion of the large farms is categorized by the number of cows. Um, we have a, a few, but typically we're in the small to medium size uh, farm range. Um, right now, as, as you all know, it's, it's a very um, challenging time for dairy. Um, it was looking to be uh, a decent year for the industry before uh, COVID hit. And so with that um, impact, it's, uh, you know, shaken the dairy industry quite a bit. And so as a result, what Vita and BAC is doing is we're um, helping the farmers by um, trying to provide as much um, relief on their debt obligations as possible to kind of carry them through this stressful time where the price of milk has really dropped significantly, and yet um, they've had to continue operations. They, you know, just because the uh, country shut down, the milk, the, the cows still needed to be milked. Um, they still have expenses to pay, and those expenses have um, been more than they're getting for their price of milk. So it's been, it's been really significant. So we've been helping by um, doing deferrals on their um, loan obligations to the extent that, that we can do that. Um, as you can imagine, with it being a, a significant portion of our portfolio, it's had an impact on VITA as well in our cash flow. But we're um, carefully monitoring that and looking ahead and making projections and doing a lot of financial analysis and stress tests. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a evolving and changing and dynamic um, space right now for, for dairy as well as everybody. Um, we did have some success with the PPP uh, program, um, and it came sort of maybe on the slightly later side for a lot of these small farms that were also perhaps um, 
you know, partnerships, sole proprietorships, but nevertheless, um, as far as the number of PPP loans that we did relative to the total, um, there were um, 82 that um, were in the ag sector and then of those 47, so roughly, you know, over half went to the dairy industry from, from what we processed. Um, so, so a significant portion went right to dairy. Um, however, it's, do, you know, a, do, a very... Do you know uh, the amount or anything, the average amount to that they may have received or? Yeah, so for us, um, for the loans that we processed, the average for dairy was about $21,000. So pretty small. Um, and, you know, part of the challenge there was just how the program was set up. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot of guidance, um, certainly not early on as far as what you could count as an employee. Um, so that's probably wasn't fully um, fully used as far as, and, and, and certainly I doubt it would meet the needs that are out there. Um, it was something, but, uh, and hopefully these will be play out the way that they're supposed to and that the loans will be forgiven. And, and that's really the key. And um, we're all hoping and crossing our fingers and waiting to see exactly what that guidance looks like when it comes out. Um, but with that sort of very undefined gray area, it was difficult to know, well, you know, what exactly is eligible to know what will be forgiven because um, having to then be stuck with a loan that you were not counting on in this environment um, no. is a big risk, you know. No, that's for sure. Ruth? Yeah. Ruth? Yeah, sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that because uh, I, I was gonna ask how many loans were, that did you anticipate being uh, forgiven, but it sounds like you don't even know that yet, which is kind of the theme of this whole crisis. Um, right, right. <laughs> um, I mean, when you process them, um, the intent is that 100% will be forgiven. And there is criteria there where, you know, 75% has to go to payroll and no more than 25% can be for other costs. And if you meet that formula, then presumably you meet the criteria for it to be forgiven, but the devil's in the details um, always. And so what qualifies as a payroll expense versus non-payroll and um, exactly how that's going to be laid out, that's what we're waiting to hear. Okay, so you don't have the, those details yet. In the meantime, are the, what is the interest rate that people have to pay or on the loan? Or is it not, they're not in paying back mode yet? They're not in paying back mode yet, no. So um, we'll be coming up soon on that eight week period where everyone will be um, applying for that forgiveness. So right now um, there is, yeah, they're not in payback mode. So okay. hopefully most of these will be essentially forgivable loans, which become grants and free money, if you will. But um, well, did, you figured, did you figure out how much they would be uh, eligible for with the records that they sent you from the farm? Yes, so we did a fair amount of scrutiny over that and tried to right size the loans, if you will. So if uh, an applicant came in asking for a loan that looked like based on what guidance was out there at the time that it would not be um, forgiven. Um, we would work with that applicant to go through that process and make sure they understood, okay, here's what, you know, is per the guidance at that time, what we believe is the amount that will be forgiven. And so we work through it that way. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I think it varied from lender to lender how they actually processed them. Yeah. Uh, Chris, you had a question and Brian the question. Go yeah, ahead, Chris. Cassie, um, so the, the feds got you this money for you to lend out. Um, is that right? Or did you have to go through a 
a bank. I'm just kind of curious if we no, this about is free money, but some it has to originate somewhere. Well, yeah, I shouldn't use that term so loosely. So the this is a program. So so um, we didn't receive any money. It's a guarantee program through the SBA and ultimately the U.S. Treasury, um, where we fund the loans with our own money and all the banks and other financial institutions are doing the same thing. So we access our own liquidity sources, be it, you know, banks have deposits, we have lenders um, and we fund that loan. So um, it is a loan that's on our balance sheet um, right so now under this program. And then um, if it works according to how it's supposed to work, at the end of eight weeks, that application to get the forgiveness goes to the SBA and they determine that it's forgivable and um, pay the loan, the loan off. Um, I don't, I, I can't exactly tell you how that money is going to flow if it comes through us or directly to the borrower um, to be determined there, but these well, are- I hope it comes to you. <laughs> <Otherwise>. <laughs> You have a real uh, problem. And then is there an envision of any administrative costs for you guys that are being reimbursed for? Yep, the, the program for? did have fees built into it that the lenders um, will receive. We haven't yet from the SBA based on um, the dollar amount of the loans. Thank you. I just I was curious about the little detail. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I believe Brian had a question. Yes, thank you, Bobby. So Cassie, you mentioned that most of the uh, loans were for small and medium sized farms, right? Well, that's just our portfolio. Okay. So what about the geographical distribution of those? Are you, are you seeing more in any one particular part of the state or is it pretty well evenly distributed? Um, I haven't actually looked at the geographical distribution, but I would venture to guess that it's concentrated where our concentrations in dairy are now, which are Addison County and Franklin County um, would be my guess. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, any other questions right now? Well, uh, go ahead and continue, uh, Casey. Um, so just getting back to what we are seeing, um, as I say, right now the farms are um, they just don't have the cash. And so our, our immediate tool is to put in deferrals um, as much as we can. And, and we've got a significant um, portion of our, our portfolio um, is on deferral. I'd say somewhere between 40 and 50% of our dairy borrowers are on deferrals. Um, and as I started to say, the unfortunate part of this whole thing from a timing standpoint is that until the pandemic hit, um, the year was looking uh, pretty, pretty good. It was an optimistic feeling out there for the farmers coming off of a really long um, downturn in the milk, milk pricing. So um, the pandemic is just one more uh, sort of factor that's hit the sector that's completely out of their control. And the farms that had started, say, expansion projects back when milk prices were good, um, they were struggling to get through the down cycle and were just starting to come out of it. And, and now they're, you know, they're debt laden, they're debt heavy because they took on expansion. And now they're just, you know, there's just no, okay. <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, you know, not all the farms though are equal and um, there are farms out there that um, have the asset base and the, um, I guess the size really to, to kind of weather this a little bit better. Um, the, the fear that I have is that when you have a, an entire sort of sector going through the same crisis, 
those values go down quite a bit. And so if um, you see a lot of farms that are, if they're not able to get through this because they don't receive some help to get through it, then it's a, a real triple whammy because they're trying to get out or liquidate or forced to get out at a time when their asset values have really really yeah. dropped. Yeah, yeah. like I, we've heard um, that uh, the price of animals is way down. I don't know, you know, and I would expect that's accurate. Uh, plants, uh, some plants are have closed, some beef plants in Pennsylvania. And, yeah. and uh, of course, milk isn't selling. So you can't you really sell them to another farmer, uh, you know, and get get much money. The value is gone. Their assets yeah. are gone. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's that's exactly right. And that's not a scenario that um, helps at all. It doesn't help the lenders because we feel under collateralized. Doesn't help the borrowers who, you know, might choose to exit because they want to. Um, but this would be the worst time to try and do that. Uh, you can't even really have an auction. So how do you how do you value things? How do you know what they're worth? Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. Um, so are, are they are the farms are they getting behind or have they been behind on their on their uh, payments and things? Uh, have they been pretty stable? I know. Uh, I don't think we had you in earlier this year to, to go over, you know, the gains and the losses and, and all that, which we normally would have had you in if we had been around Montpelier uh, to, to hear yeah. that. Uh, so how, how is that, how, how's their portfolio holding up uh, as far as losses and things? Um. As far as actual losses, we are, uh, so, so just to distinguish between a loss where um, basically VAC and the borrower have exhausted all of the sort of options to keep going um, and it's say in a liquidation mode and yeah. the collateral that secures those loans was not enough to pay off all the debts. You know, historically, um, that figure has been very, very low um, because we work with the farmers a long time. We're, we're very um, patient and try, I mean, it's a last resort to, you know, force somebody out of business. So. Um, that's really one of the roles that VAC plays and why, it, you know, VAC is here um, because we can do that, you know, traditional lenders really can't do that. Um, so to back to your question, we haven't really taken any significant losses because of COVID, but it's also been a very compressed time frame. So um, yeah. we're not looking to liquidate anybody right now. That would be, <clears throat> you know, uh, that's not even on the table. There were, you know, accounts that were in bank bankruptcy well before this. They're still in bankruptcy. That's a whole nother um, story. Not that we have a lot of those, but that that's, you know, happened pre-COVID and has nothing to do with the current situation. The current situation is, you know, the health crisis that's, slammed every sector um, and dairy it's been been one that's probably been slammed even harder because they've had to keep operating they didn't have the option of closing the doors and not incurring those overhead expenses and um, laying people off um, they've had to keep going and milking the cows um, and then at the same time their income has taken a big um, drop yeah it, you know, I was always amazed and impressed um, when Joe would come in and tell us, you know, about the low percentage rate of loss that uh, 
that they've taken, you know, from the from the back program over the years and how other businesses and and people that borrow from Vita was always higher than the ag sector that farmers usually, you know, if there's any way at all, they pay their bills. And and that's um, you know, always been I've always been impressed by that. Yeah, it's true. It's true. So, uh, Ruth? Yeah. You're I, muted. I was just wondering um, if you knew I, beyond Vita what the total number of those paycheck protection program loans the ag sector has gotten in Vermont, if, if you have those sort of sector wide numbers. Yeah. Um... I, I don't have it by sector. I can tell you that for the entire state, it's about 1.3 billion. Um, I think there were 12,000 loans. My guess would be that ag is a very, very small portion. Um, I heard in testimony that um, Yankee Farm Credit gave to the House Ag Committee. They did a, I don't know, I think it was like about 150 PPP loans. I don't know how many of those went to dairy and I don't know the dollar amount, um, okay. but still, it's you know, still, that's a small number. It's a small number, but they have, there have been at least a decent number of farms mm -hmm. that have applied. Do you know if they, if there's been, I mean, I'm assuming you did outreach to farms saying, Hey, you are eligible. And absolutely, absolutely. As we did with the idle program, when the farms first became eligible, which was quite late in that program rollout. Um, the good news there is that when the money apparently ran out um, and it became known or obvious to um, the SBA and Treasury that farms were only given like one or two days to apply by the time they were right. eligible to apply, they extended that um, window so that farms are now I think pretty much the only entity that still is allowed to apply, they've kind of shut it off to others. Others, and do you know, has that program gotten its act together? We heard kind of nightmares about it, yeah. how it was functioning. Yeah, um, I know there were a lot of hiccups early on that the SBA has worked hard to um, address and I have heard that money has started flowing. Um, this morning, I did touch base with the SBA to find out specifically for the farmers how that's going and was really pleasantly surprised that um, there is a measurable number of farmers, there are a measurable number of farmers in Vermont that have received idle funds. Um, I think it was about, um, 73, yeah, 73 um, idle applications from Vermont ag industry. So I should say it's ag industry. Um, I didn't get it broken down by NAICS code. So I don't know if how much of that is dairy versus non-dairy. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but all right, at least <laughs> some people have gotten it <laughs> or- huh? At least some um, of people in the farm sector have gotten it, which is yes, helpful yeah. to know. Just trying to get a big, you know, a full picture of the resources that have been or may be available to that. Yeah, aspect. yeah. I don't think it's a lot of money. Um, of those seventy-three, I think it totals about five million in money that has gone out um, to the ag sector. Got so, it. Uh, uh, is that? That's the program that's run out of Texas that basically has a $10,000 like yep. uh, forgiveness. Uh, it's a, like a 10,000 up to a $10,000 advance that's really considered like a grant. You get to keep that money regardless of whether the loan is approved or not. Um, there were hiccups with that early on. So I think you know, if anything, if there's a silver lining here for the farmers on that is that they were better off by being late to that program um, so that some of these hiccups could have, you know, have been worked out a little bit, hopefully. Um, so 
you know, and again, I don't have data on how much of that 5 million is grants versus loans. Um, I do know that the $10,000 figure that was um, given to everyone early on has turned out to be pretty much less than 10,000 in, in most cases, because it's turned out to be a per employee number as opposed to what people thought. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> and, and you can do both uh, idle and PPP? You can, but if you get a PPP, um, you have to use, um, you have to pay off the portion of the idle that um, went to, to payroll so that you're not getting sort of money for the same purpose from both programs. Yeah, so you aren't double dipping them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and are any more ag questions from that? I'd like to hear a little bit about um, broadband and, and how, you know, the Northeast Kingdom, I mean, I'm fortunate where I live, so I have excellent uh, broadband, but a lot of Essex County and the more, even the more rural towns within our Orleans County, um, you know, can't get broadband. And I know we're working hard to expand that out with some um, covert uh, money that's supposedly coming. Um, so how's that work yeah. with you folks? Well, um, you know, I probably have a lot more questions um, on this than I can speak to as far as providing any uh, definitive information here. All I know is that there is some, um, we have an existing broadband program. It was created last year. Um, it's a very small pot of money that the state appropriated to VITA to set up a loan loss reserve um, to do relatively small projects. Um, we're capped at a loan size of 4 million, which I say small, that's actually a very, very large loan for VITA. Um, none of our other programs have, have loan sizes that, that large. But having said that, um, in, in proportion to the amount of money that's needed to build out broadband, it's small. Um, nevertheless, there's been some interest in it. Um, and so we, um, we do have state support to um, help build out broadband. So far, there's been little uptake in the program itself because there still is um, sort of the, the, the CUDs are being formed and they have to do feasibility studies. And so it was, um, we got the program on our, um, in our statute before um, a lot of them are ready to apply. Now we enter COVID and the CARES Act and there's um, hopefully momentum here to use some of that money to actually build out broadband the way it needs to, to be done um, and, and use some you know, federal public money to do that. And it's, it's a lot of money that's required. Um, I know that the um, Department of Public Service is working on a plan. Um, USDA has some money. Um, we have we we go back and forth with USDA on how much Vermont can access that money. Um, so there's there's a lot of questions at this point. Uh, Vita is being brought into the conversations, uh, sort of as a potential source to leverage some more money. Um, it's something that would be, you know, tremendous to our balance sheet. So I'm looking at how I would mitigate that risk, spread that risk around to other um, entities that are more um, involved in broadband on a, say, national scale. So it's, you know, early on, but there's also that time pressure. If we're going to use CARES money, there's only six months to use it. So, um, that's and a problem because you can't build out broadband statewide in six months. What about if you had a if you had a plan and a contract, even though it went 
beyond the six months if you were qualified prior to uh, the deadline? Would you still be okay to keep working after the six months? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Um, and it's probably one more, I don't know, Michael, if, if you know the answer to what qualifies as um, having deployed the CARES money, can it be allocated in a restricted sense, but not be at the, you know, ultimate recipient level yet? Or I, I'm unclear on that. Um, so there was a call between NCSL and the National Association of Legislative Fiscal Officers with U.S. Treasury um, just the other day, uh, and we, our office took some notes. So this isn't binding on anyone. It's not a Treasury guidance document, etc. It's just a reflection of the, the call. Um, but they said the money needs to be expended by December 30th, 2020, but they are still trying to figure out the details of what total expenditure is. Um, just, and, and they gave an example. Their example was, if you um, enter a contract for broadband deployment on December 30th, but there's no fruitful construction, that that does not qualify. Um, so I, th I could understand that. So th there, there's still some ambiguity, but they're, they're kind of drawing the line at expenditure and they have to define, further define what that means. Well, boy, that doesn't give anyone much time to do a plan and and all that. Right, so it's it's a, a pretty big challenge. Um, so I'll be talking to the commissioner later this morning on this yeah. topic and trying to figure out some of these yeah, that, questions. That would be uh, most helpful. And Michael, are, you're gonna keep on top of that info and so we'll have that as we move forward for to give our constituents, basically. Yes, and uh, you know Steve Klein and, and Stephanie and JFO and Becky Wasserman and 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 basically Luke and and Jen Carby and I have been been following that issue and trying to get as much information. You know, tr Treasury's doing, I think, the best that they can do. Um, that they're dealing with a ton of questions from the states, ton of scenarios. Well, if I use it like this, or if my school funding formula is this, does it qualify? Can I build a building? You know, th things like that. And 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 um, it's they're 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 sincerely trying to achieve the intent of of the CARES Act and getting the money out. Um, but they still have to answer a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, Chris, I think you had your hand up. Uh, it's okay. I, I mean, I guess I would say uh, we may well have a challenge of uh, whether or not we can spend the money. So I, to my colleagues and more broadly, uh, we got to be brainstorming here because sending money back to the treasury makes very little sense at a time when so many of our folks are struggling. Well, you take a lot of farm operations, uh, even uh, you know the small and the mediums rely on broadband so bad that um, you know, and and they're out in the rural parts of the state, uh, you know, from water quality management to to nutrient management. To, you know, there's so much of so much depends on having broadband now that uh, it's really important to get as much out of this help uh, as we can. Yeah. Um, any further uh, info on that, Casey? You know, um, I don't. I don't really think I can add a whole lot to this. As I say, there's um, more challenges and questions right now. 
Yeah. And um, I mean, I think Senator Pearson brings up a good point, but at the same time, um, <laughs> I guess maybe it's the optimist in me that's saying, here's, here's the uh, golden opportunity to get a lot of federal money to build out something that needs to be done at, at a, you know, at, at the public funding level, because <laughs> private money is just proving to be very, very challenging and it's not getting the momentum. And so I'd hate to see this um, not get some good traction, but yeah, there are definitely challenges. And, and maybe, maybe there's something at the national level with, I mean, we're not the only state in this. Everybody's got broadband issues. And so, um, well, I'm hopeful that that will sort of work its way through the the state, the national level, and and figure out you know <laughs> what's realistic here. And Congressman Welsh has been very clear that many of them are trying a, a second round that will involve broadband funding. I mean, it, we we could do some stuff by December. Yesterday in finance, we spent a lot of time in a joint committee with House Energy and Technology and the Commissioner of Public Service to ask what are we doing in the short term what's realistic it was a challenging conversation but there are people clearly thinking about that so um yeah yeah and how do you did you talk about how much money was there uh chris it was where well in in that we could qualify for is the pot small oh. the pot <laughs> well eight hundred um, million or eighty thousand dollars i mean that's an interesting question we have actually been sort of frozen out of some of the federal broadband pockets of money because we did a bunch of spending back in the era and the vtel kind of investment um time so i know that Leahy is trying to um get us back in there but the most promising thing I've heard is not that we would use COVID money uh, that we currently just got no, for broadband, but that a second round uh, that is geared directly to rural broadband may be coming in subsequent COVID relief bills. Welsh and others are working hard on that. A bill just dropped. You know, who knows? But, but let's face it, we do know Vermont is not unique in struggling to educate kids who are sitting at home with spotty broadband uh, all over the place. Yeah, uh, Brian. Thank you, Bobby. I, I actually, I'm gonna ask Chris another question, not Cassie. Um, do you have an idea of how much money is needed or another way to look at it would be percentage wise, what percent of Vermont still does not have uh, broadband? In other words, is this a problem that's never gonna be solved because it's just, you know, trillions of dollars, or or do you have a firm number? Uh, well, firm numbers are tough to come by. Uh, the highest number I've heard is fiber to the home everywhere. So that's the pinnacle. That's that's something that it would be. You know, uh, uh, New York City kind of goal would be a billion dollars. Um, the the more recent estimate was something between i th i want to say 90 million and 240 million and that is to make sure everyone has some kind of high speed internet that is uh but the problem is and that one of the complicating factors and why the estimates are all over the place is it's we're we're pretty far beyond the time when everyone in troy has no broadband and everyone in Newport has broadband. What we're what we're seeing is rural communities, downtowns have decent internet, and it's and it's hiring somebody to go get the last, you know, twenty roads in the edge of town, and that's a very high cost proposition. And the people that are serving downtown don't want to do that. And so why would a company say, oh, I'll, I'll go get all those really expensive last mile people? This is the challenge. And, and so at the same time, you know, the EC fibers and some of our success yep. stories, yep. they've been successful because they went to regions where there was nothing and they could expect a very high pickup rate. 
And now we're starting to see in the work Cassie and, and folks have been uh, involved in is that next tier where, all right, you know, it's, it's only whatever, 30% of people have access to high speed. So we think there'll be a pretty good pickup rate. And that just gets harder and harder as we go. So good people are thinking about it. We've not had a, a I would say a very concrete plan on the whole picture. Um, and then people like me and others yesterday were saying, well, what can we do in the next four months so that in the fall, more of our kids during a lockdown period will have access, more of our teachers for that matter, you know, and that would be a wireless option. Some of those things that are decent solutions that could be decent. We're, we're a lot of people are wrestling through it. I wouldn't be surprised if we had some special committee get set up <clears throat> to really drive this home in the next month. I hope we will, but people are working on it, but it is a whole range and it depends what you're truly asking for. It's not unlike what happened with electricity. I think, was it Victory that was the last town in Vermont to get electricity? And, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the 1950s, right? Like In the 60s, I think. Yeah, so yeah. that seems like, you know, I, I was uh, not far off there, you know? So that is kind of remarkable and we're trying, it is very much like that. That's wow. where the electric co-ops came from. Yes. And that's where the, you know, the, the other issue is, do we keep, paying Comcast to build out and send all the money out of state, or do you try to invest in, in local entities that keep the money moving and working here? That's my desire, obviously. And a lot of people have been talking about that, but that's another challenge that we have very clearly. Of course. Yeah. It really, like you said earlier, Vermont isn't alone in this situation. And uh, this should be a national uh issue and set up like George Aiken was a big player, uh, Governor Aiken, uh, when he was in Washington as our senator to set up rural electrification because in the village like up north here in Troy, in North Troy, they had, uh, you know, lights and everything and everything was hunky dory, but you move a, a mile up the road where our farms are and we were still milking, I wasn't, because it was just before my time. But uh, my dad and his brothers, and they were all milking, you know, 60 cows back then by hand. And uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, lugging ice. Uh, it was a nightmare. And, but anyways, um, uh, we got to get moving here. And Cassie did... Did you have anything else that you would like to present to us? Because uh, we, we know you're busy and don't want to steal your time away from you. Yeah, uh, no, thank you. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm happy to be given the opportunity here and just to um, share what I'm seeing and, and hearing from, from farmers that, uh, you know, they, they're in a situation where they just need some help uh, cash, not loans. They don't need more debt, and um, they're they're in it just as uh, all the other sectors have been hit. Um, so, I have you that, have you have you um, received many requests from other businesses and and uh, like how much they've lost or what they're doing, uh, you know, in other sectors that you manage? Um, well, we've got a, a fairly decent concentration in the hospitality industry, and I would Boy. include restaurants and hotels and caterers, event planners, um, travel and tourism, kind of all in that bucket. And, uh, that's another tough one because they've been shut down and it's uncertain at this point when they'll really be able to open up. And it's one thing to be allowed to open up and another thing to know that the customers are going to come. Yeah. And so that's um, something that's lurking out there as, uh, you know, how long will it take that group of businesses to be back and really open. 
Um, but they they haven't incurred the running costs that the farms have because they've been closed and the farms have to feed their animals and get ready for spring's work and all those good things. Right, right. So if they had, you know, a decent savings and sort of cash account to carry them through, they're, they're better off than others that may have maybe just purchased a business and took on a lot of debt. Um, so that's going to vary from sort of business to business um, as far as their ability to get through this. Yeah. Um, thank you. Are there other questions by any of the committee members? Uh, no. Well, we want to thank you uh, very much for giving us your time. And uh, hopefully uh, we're working on putting together uh, some kind of a direct payment uh, plan for our farmers. And hopefully uh, we can get that done in, in the near future to, to help everybody. Terrific. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. I'm happy to provide any help I can. So um, just let me know. Yeah. Well, thanks again and have a good day and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. you thanks, everyone. Yeah. Um, so, um, we, um, that was a real good testimony, I think, uh, and, uh, but it sounds like the, those guys are having a hard time having any money in their pocket to do much with. Um, the, uh, I was kind of surprised in the, um, uh, in the amount that, uh, the PPP program was helping out with. Um, so that that's really uh, probably been a saver to a lot of those people, and a lot of our farm people. Um, <clears throat> any other thoughts on, on uh, Casey's comments? Nope. Everybody's happy. Yeah, I mean, I see that um, Ella and Nancy are here. So I'm wondering if we, are we going to hear from them and then are we going to talk about the bill or what's the plan for this morning? Yeah, I I didn't see that they're on, but if they're on, we can move right on to uh, Gus and, and uh, the crew from VHCB. I don't see their pictures anywhere. <laughs> Ella, Nancy, are you guys in Gus, are you folks on? Gus is um, not on yet. Can you hear me? Yeah. Nope. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. There's oh, Gus. There he is. He was going to kick stuff off, so I'm glad to see him jumping on. Yeah, we're, for some reason, we're a little early. We're usually a half hour behind, but. Um, but anyhow, good to see you folks and and uh, we can get right with it and get this over with so you guys can get back to your jobs. Um, so Gus, uh, good morning. It's uh, good to see you and um, could you tell us a little bit about how your, your uh, programs are going and uh, Maybe I know you and I had a chat about a grant that you've applied for, uh, for um, I think for ag and stuff. Uh, and, uh, and we'll hear uh, from you in regards to whatever it is you want to tell us. You're muted, Gus. Is that better? Uh, a little bit. I'll try to get closer. Is this? No, you're fine. I'm just giving you a hard time. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, that won't be the first or last time. <laughs> no. Uh, so thank you uh, to all of you uh, for what you're doing in this very difficult time. Um, the last time we all talked, uh, and we really wanted to continue the conversation we had when you had a joint meeting with the other body, uh, Ag Committee. Um, 
was about the issue of farmland access. And I guess I, I would just start by saying that um, this COVID pandemic has put a exclamation point, at least for me, but I think for lots of us on the importance of a food supply that is based here in New England and not dependent upon uh, way distant travel. And, and I think we're finding that for many, many products that uh, are coming from overseas, but uh, food is so essential. Um, and, uh, and obviously one of the things in our statute uh, that I know the chair is well aware of is it tells us um, that we need to respond in a timely manner to unpredictable circumstances and unique opportunities. Um, and this certainly was an unpredictable circumstance the state of Vermont finds itself in now. Um, so we are trying to figure out how best to add um, our expertise and our systems and our partners to um, both responding to the immediate pandemic uh, and also to planning for the future, uh, as we always are, because the fundamentals of our work is really about making investments for the long term and to support the working land enterprises as well as the working lands. And, and really, when you think about our work, it, it is fundamentally about you know, rural community development. It's also about climate change. It's about water quality. And I did want to mention uh, to this committee, because you've been so involved in the water quality issues, that ANR came to us a few weeks ago and asked us to take on um, the responsibilities or to consider taking on responsibilities and apply to be a clean water service provider for the Northeast Kingdom, which we intend to submit an application for um, at, the, uh, at the end of May. Uh, we're also talking with them about playing a statewide role in the enhancement grant program that was set up. But we wanted to focus our remarks today uh, just in, in really the immediate response, which the viability program and Ella will describe for you um, and how we think we can be helpful. And your, your colleagues in the Appropriations Committee have been asking us as well uh, through your joint fiscal staff are there costs that we are incurring that can be supported by the COVID relief fund as they look at the pressures that are gonna be on the state budget? So in a moment, I'm gonna turn it over to Ella to talk about um, what the viability programs plans are in that regard. I do wanna say, um, I understand at one point there was some discussion about the size of the viability program having a staff of four which is accurate, but there's a statewide network that we support. And we are currently touching uh, and working with 150 farms a year, I think 850 farms over the life of the program. Um, the second thing I just wanna emphasize and, and, and Nancy Everhart will speak with you also is once we get through the pandemic, um, there's no doubt that there will be changes in the agricultural industry. and the most effective thing I think that effective financial tool we have to help young farmers get on farms, and this goes to our discussion uh, with your colleagues in the other body, uh, in providing farmland access is buying down the cost of entry onto farms through the development rights program. And just to put a clear point on that, when we get through this and there are, there are opportunities in front of us for land transfers to uh, new owners, uh, which will be the case for some farmers who want to retire. Um, uh, development rights generally take up about 40 to 60% of the cost of acquisition of a farm. So it's a, it's a really critical tool. Um, another thing we have worked on with your committee has been a program that you initiated called the Rural Economic Development Initiative. And um, it has been enormously successful. Again, Ella will describe that. But we've been spending $75,000 a year for the last couple of years and bringing back multiple millions of dollars to small rural communities through that program. And we think it's time for it to uh, get an increase. That may not be a good source, a good priority for the COVID relief fund, but we think the program has proven its, its worthiness. So um, 
with that as an overview, I'm going to turn it over to Ella to really describe how the viability program is reorienting itself um, to uh, work with farmers in the face of this pandemic, uh, both on an ongoing basis, but we also think that there is a need for um, increasing support there in the short term. Uh, I had a conversation with uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Ted Brady about a month ago now, and he, what he said to me was, I need an expert who can have a half hour to hour conversation with every business in the state to help them navigate their way through this, to figure out what programs they're eligible for, how to apply for them, what programs they're not eligible for. The, S, the small business development centers, I think have been allocated about a million dollars to do that kind of work. They don't work very much with the farm community. And we think the viability program and its partners at Extension, at NOFA Vermont, the Intervale Center, the Center for an Ag Economy, along with a series of private consultants we work with, are primed to have those conversations um, with landowners, with business operators in the ag and forestry sectors. So with that as an overview, I'll turn it over to Ella, um, except to say we are talking as the chair indicated with a number of philanthropic institutions, uh, including the Community Foundation, about any sources that can be immediately provided to provide assistance. They haven't come to a conclusion yet, but we're working on that as well. Um, so Ella, I, I'll hand the floor over to you. Gus, yeah. are you able to stick with us? I'm happy to hear from you. Yes, Ella. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, if you wanna throw a question my way now, Senator, I'm happy to take it, but. No, if you're sticking around, let's hear from Ella because she'll probably cover my question yeah. anyway. Yeah, the only thing, uh, you ought to send Jane uh, an email or uh, because I chatted with her this morning in regards to the READY uh, program. And of course, she knows that it's one heck of a good deal. But she said she hadn't heard from you, Gus, on the... On the uh, you know, maybe getting one more or two more people there, but God for, you know, if you can trade a seventy-five thousand dollars for even a million, you know, I'd sit there and trade all day long. Um, so uh, ship her off an email, and or we can talk a little bit later on. I will do that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Good morning, Ella. Good morning, Senator Stiller and everyone. Thanks for having us. Uh, I, I'm going to just spend probably five to 10 minutes, probably 10 minutes, talking through uh, both just a good, re healthy reminder of sort of how our viability program works because it's relevant for the COVID response work that we're doing now and that we are anticipating trying to figure out how to carry some of this uh, recovery, response and recovery work, you know, not just in the immediate weeks, but for months, uh, if not years, forward um, for the working land sector. So I'm going to cover a little bit of that and feel free to stop me with questions along the way. Um, otherwise, I'll just sort of plow through my notes and then really trying to leave as much of the time for discussion and, and, and conversation and questions. Um, so to start with, just a really brief overview. What we're doing right now in terms of response work is that um, over the past few weeks, we launched a very basic intake form that asks any kind of working lands, farm, food, forestry sector, business, do you need help? If so, what kind of help? And then we have a couple of, we've hired a couple of our best consultants for extra hours so that they can just immediately do hour long Con the emergency consultations with any business that contacts us. And in that hour, they sort of assess the situation with the business owner, uh, talk through their most immediate concerns, point them to resources. We're very well, we're such a networked entity already. Uh, and we work with so many other agencies and partners that uh, our key business advisors can point them to all the different resources and help to be a one-stop shop to get them to the right places that are the right fit for their variety of issues that they're dealing with. Um, and then also uh, design a few follow-up steps for that business. And then in most cases right now, that same consultant is then available for up to five hours after that initial intake call to help them with those next steps, regardless of what they are. 
if it's a good fit for that consultant. And if it's not a good fit for that consultant, introducing them to somebody else in our network or outside of our network where it is. So really, you know, carrying that business through what their next steps are in as best way as possible. Um, uh, Ella, is that uh, the people that were doing uh, farm viability visits, uh, those, that group of uh, experts? Yeah. Um, yes, we have two of our top consultants, Sarah Flack, who um, works with primarily with uh, dairy and livestock farmers, and Rose Wilson, who is an expert on the sort of uh, sales and marketing and also sort of financial rec record keeping. Rose is probably the leading expert on helping farms through PPP, uh, IDLE, and PUA um, as three key immediate financial resources to help and helping them identify which of those programs, if any, are a good fit for their situation. And then literally helping them prepare the documents to get the application together and walking them through the application online, if need be, through screen sharing with them from afar. So I'd say about 80%, 70 to 80% of our response work in terms of hours right now is just helping people apply for those one of those one or more of those three programs, primarily PPP and uh, and PUA right now is a really big one. Um, uh, the pandemic unemployment assistance. The idol is certainly a fit in some cases for farms. We're really glad it's now available to farms. Um, and as you know, it's sort of only open right now to farmers for applying, but uh, it's not usually the best fit for most farmers. And how, do you have any idea of how many farmers uh, you've already kind of helped out or that you're working with? Yes, we, I mean, we haven't publicized this widely yet, but we're working with about um, 30 different businesses, not just farmers, probably 80% of those are farmers. Uh, we, it is open to other kinds of food companies that are not on farm, as well as folks in the wood products and um, logging industries, so, or in forestry in general. So we have a couple of folks in that category, but largely they've been working with farmers and largely that work has for the last few weeks been largely centered around, centered around those federal, pro, federal and state programs. But it, also a lot of our work um, and work that's happening more through our partner organizations, not those consultants has been around uh, transitioning to online sales or transitioning to other kinds of direct consumer and figuring out how to set up farm stands to comply with state regulations and, and such. So. Um, a lot of other work is also going on, particularly that would be the second category that I think we're spending the most time helping folks with at the moment. And we expect these needs to sort of shift and, and trend in different directions over time. But we were felt really good about being able to just launch an immediate intake response effort with some of our key strongest consultants in our network. We have a couple more consultants waiting in the wings for us to have a little more funding to deploy. With consultants, and as and we're this week gonna tomorrow gonna launch a full-on press release and very uh, very broad outreach effort to let people know that this is, exists, and we expect the the number of calls we get to go up to like 50 or more a week easily. Uh, and so we're trying to ramp up as we ramp up our outreach and make sure people know about it, and we have the funding to do so. Ramp, ramping up the consultants that are available on hand to give those immediate, you know, within 24 to 48 hours spend time on the phone with folks and go through their situation. So that's what we're calling our rapid response business coaching. Yeah, and, and you, have enough, you have enough people right now to handle what you're doing? We, our money sort of runs out this week, but yesterday the Working Lens Enterprise Board um, allocated $50,000 to keep it going for the next five, five to six or seven weeks, probably probably for the better part of the next two months, hopefully, depending on how much, the, how the need grows. Um, so we have some immediate funding and now we're sort of looking at the next six months, the second half of the calendar year, thinking we're gonna need something like $30,000 a month to really ramp the capacity to meet the needs. Uh, one thing I wanted to describe also is that this work includes Farm First and the Vermont Ag Mediation Program to you know, Farm First is funded at very minimal level, I think something like $20,000 a year or something like that through the state, through the ag um, agency. And yet they're able to stand up a program. Maybe it's more than that, but I, I know it's not a huge amount of money. It supports, I think, a part-time staff person at Invest EAP to provide those 
employee assistance program type services and mental health and counseling to the farm farmers and farm families, as you I'm sure know. Um, and then the ag mediation program is federally funded through USDA to support mediation for farmers, primarily around their lending with FSA and other lenders uh, to mediate uh, financial issues. And, but it can be uh, used also to help with some intergenerational family succession work and some other mediation related issues. So we work really closely with both those programs. We've never funded their work before, but as part of getting some funds in the door at Viability for all of our network of partners that are all doing um, this rapid response work in addition to some consultants that we've put on, um, on contract, we'll also be providing a bit of funding to those two organizations, Farm First and Ag Mediation to help them ramp up capacity so that they have enough time, staff hours to go out and like contact all of their past clients, contact people who have called Farm First in the past with financial or mental health challenges or stress, anxiety, and get back in touch with some of them and see how they're doing right now um, and do a lot more pro uh, proactive work rather than just waiting for the phone to ring. So yeah. um, that's been yeah. our, that's sort of our co immediate COVID response work. And as I mentioned, we're looking at $30,000 a month or so for the rest of the calendar year to be able to increase the capacity enough to meet that. Um, yes, please. So you, uh, Rose. Yeah, so you said that um, you're, you've served 30 businesses. Is that, is that correct? 30? A week, a week for the past. 30 a week, okay, okay. So 30 per week, and do you have a breakdown of those and how much outreach have you been doing? We've done very little outreach. We've mostly just put stuff on our website and let our, our viability partners know that they could send clients that they can't handle to us so that we can help get them immediate response. And maybe then they'll go back to those other programs and for, the, for more long-term viability support. Um, so I, I don't have a lot of data on that. It, we've just been so focused on just getting the people, the consultations yep. we're getting, putting in place this week, sort of the a data management collection system so that we have information on who those people are and what their primary needs were when they came into the program and how many hours they're spending with consultants and what kind of business they are. That's the kind of data okay. we're collecting and we'll have by the end of the week. So if 30 yeah. per week and it's been about six weeks, that's about a hundred and no, we've only really launched this. This is our third week of of providing that immediate okay. business coaching. But and we see this as a key part of the long haul of, of response and recovery. So we plan to have this intake process and, and sort of rapid response coaching set up for for the time to come, in addition to the long-term viability business assistance. It includes 10 organizations that you're really familiar with. We've for 18 years been partnering with the Intervale Center, UVM Extension, and NOFA Vermont. But then Center for an Agricultural Economy has a staff team of three, I think. Uh, the uh, Sustainable Jobs Fund uh, does business coaching under our funding. Land for Good is a small organization uh, um, regionally that does work around succession. So we have about 10 organizations. And then the um, uh, Vermont Woodlands Association does work with uh, Woodlands owners under our viability programs. So about 10 organizations that we contract with annually through the viability program with state and federal funds. Uh, and that we put out about $700,000 annually to support those organizations. And each of them have one or two staff and then also use consultants. So on the ground deployed, our program annually has about 18 people who are uh, you know, most of their job or all of their job is doing viability business coaching and mostly are aimed at business planning, succession planning and feasibility analysis. So just as a reminder, we have this whole deployed network of advisors across the state. They're not, you know, they're not VHTV staff, but we, and so they each organization has their own areas of, of expertise and specialty. And we do get applications through VHTV and make sure they're lined up with the right organization the so, yeah. so one of the things that we've been talking about is, you know, we've heard that there's a need for more of these types of services, um, that there just isn't enough capacity. Um, but, it, you know, based on your description, it sounds like you have a lot of people in the network who are doing this. And I'm wondering if you know what the, where the holes are, like the types of farm food and, and 
forestry businesses that you're not able to serve because you just don't have the expertise in your network or, or do you not see holes? Um, we do see holes. So one, one thing I'd like to just make a comparison for you, just I think it's helpful to understand that SBDC, Vermont SBDC is a, it, you know, is a publicly funded entity that's uh, run through the state college system or in partnership with the state college system and deploys about the same number of staff across the state to work with all kinds of small businesses. And then, you know, I'd, I'd love to just, I'd love to put that side to my side right now because they automatically under the CARES Act got a million dollars to expand their capacity. And, you know, while, you know, as we put out $700,000 a year annually for that kind of uh, same number of roughly similar number of folks across the state, you know, and, and yet Vermont created this incredible system that's the envy of every state and some many states are working to emulate with state funding. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no CARES Act automatic uh, increase in capacity for this work that we're doing. So, you know, just to put it in perspective, we have a lot of money deployed that what we're doing right now with a lot of those contractors is saying, instead of doing, you know, 10 very in-depth business plans this year with 10 clients, maybe you do eight long-term business planning projects or seven, and you take the rest of our contract dollars and for those other couple of long-term projects and deploy that into many short-term uh, more COVID related assistance projects. So our existing network is able to work with more people right now. That doesn't mean there's more staff deployed through that network to actually be boots on the ground. There's not more hours available. Yeah. yeah. Have you been able, did you have another question, Rose? Well, I, I mean, I, I appreciate what you just said, Ella, but you didn't uh, yeah, quite answer I my question. I haven't gotten to answer your question yet. Yeah. Uh, which I'm is where do you see the holes and what what types of businesses in yeah. your sector are you not able to serve because you don't have the expertise? Yes, sorry, I was I was on my way there, but I saw a hand from Senator Pearson. So let me get there quickly. Um, I'm looking at uh, page 80 in the um, 2020 Ag Strategic Plan that the uh, that the Agency of Ag and BSAF led, and I co-authored a couple of pieces in that one on business and technical assistance. So just as a reference, I'm just going to share, share with you because I drafted this and this is based on our network's vision of where the gaps are. So it calls for 17 additional FTEs that we wish we had to really meet the needs of the agricultural sector and food sector. And it includes six additional business advisors focused on succession planning and transitioning to new production strategies and diversification. Two additional technical assistance advisors focused on land and environmental assessment. That's something that we have very, you know, we have a couple of people who really can do that with folks. We wish we had several just dedicated to that. Two consultants on um, marketing and sales, two on grazing and small and, and large animal livestock, the position that we're really missing at, at UVM Extension. Four FTEs on uh, specialized types of production, such as grain, hemp, apples, certain types of production that we see as increasing in the state. Um, and then one additional FTE at Farm First and or Ag Mediation to assist farmers in crisis. So that's that's a summary and it's, you know, I think there are many people who got together to create that draft and then many others at the agency and at VSJF that concurred with that level. So it, that, that represents a very uh, wide understanding and, and, and um, comprehensive and, and agreed upon understanding of where the biggest gaps are. Okay, thanks. And that's and in the current part of the Ag the, the, the section that's already been done? Yes, the piece okay. that was presented to you in January, yes. Okay, I'll have to dig that out. Thank you. And, it's on uh, page 80. We'll get to Chris. Uh, have, have you been able to get any money out of ACCD for, for all this uh, promotion work that you're doing to try to get people on the, on the PPP and these other programs? Uh, have they come forth with any uh, contract money for you or you on your own? We have not seen any funding from ACCD, just partnership and getting the word out and um, sharing resources and their, the materials they've been sending out have been very, very helpful for our network. Looks like Gus might wanna chime in though. Yeah, uh, Gus. So we, yeah. we have not asked them for financial resources. They've been pretty overwhelmed with um, work 
across the state with all kinds of businesses. Um, I think it's a fair question for us to put to them. Our first instinct was, as Ella said, to convert some of the uh, existing resources just to respond. But I think that's something we certainly can put on the table uh, with them. Well, I should think that th uh, this cost should be covered by covert uh, 19 money. And a lot of it's running through that agency. And I would hope that, you know, they would be willing to share a little bit of that uh, because it sounds like you've got quite a clientele of businesses that, that call you, depend on you and, and you've been working with right along. So you aren't creating a new wheel uh, to deal with it. Uh, but anyways, uh, keep keep hitting them up for it. Um, we'll we'll get back to that. We'll call on Chris. Thank you. Um, so Ella, I, I, a couple of questions, and then a more broad question. The seventeen people is that the total universe? Then you listed who they would be. Right, the number of. You, you said you said there were 17 the people and then you said we need somebody in grazing and oh. are those subs of the 17 yes. 17 to universe yes what's and the total have a, do you have do you have a crude budget for what that would cost you yeah we I, just said I yes staff generally budgets about a hundred thousand dollars per fte so, so 1.5 million something like that 1.7 yeah what um do you have those people I, i'm trying to understand I, I have a little series of questions do we have those people like if we said yes and we got the money out the door next month how quickly would this be execution how could quickly could you execute it i think uh, no we do not have those 17 people in our minds who you know, aren't otherwise <laughs> engaged in, in working to some degree, we, you know, we're, we know we're gonna need to attract and develop some of this expertise. I think we have more people available on the sales and marketing side uh, who would be contractors from the private sector, whereas like a livestock specialist for the, you know, ideally would be placed at UVM and it's gonna take them a year and a half if, if they're even really planning on filling a position. So I think, I think, be, I think it would take two years to get that kind of capacity and, and that would be like a concerted effort to build that capacity. Okay, um, Michael, is Michael with us? I, th yeah, I think he's listening. My, my question is um, sort of to the chair's question. A lot of that seems to me to be food security and a, a, a logical response of the legislature to look at the future and say, holy smokes, We've got a, a troubled ag industry and we need to be feeding people and we're worried about supply chains. And I guess it's this tired question of, is this kind of um, intellectual infrastructure a reasonable uh, reaction or parts of it to uh, a COVID response, therefore eligible for some of this federal money? To your opinion, I mean, it's a crude, it, it's a very, a uh, broad conversation, I realize, but. Um, you know, I think the devil will be in the details. I, I think there's opportunity for, for some of those, um, some of those positions and some of those activities to qualify. Uh, but it has to be expended by December 30th. Um, and so that that question which we've already discussed is still a little gray yeah. um uh, but i also think that that certain things and I, this isn't in regard to what ella said i heard or i was asked last week whether a capital construction water quality project could qualify for covid funds and i'm like yeah i i don't think so no, um, I, right and no. and so the, it it Although there are projects that are definitely would support the food system, would support food security and help prevent further um, insecurity if, in a future pandemic, I don't know if all of them are going to qualify. 
Okay. Um, Thank you. Um, my last question is uh, for Ella and Gus. We've been discussing um, the idea of a direct uh, relief package for dairy and had a discussion about trying to say to farmers who are uh, applying for this money, um, encouraging some way for them to connect with the succession planning. It's been misinterpreted that Senate Ag wants them to force them to diversify. That's not the case, but we, we are interested, I think, in the work you're doing and, and stimulating that discussion. And so my question is, um, while we figure out how to do that, assuming we do so, I'm worried that we're already at capacity. You guys have testified as some of the leaders of this kind of work that um, that that you're already you know overstressed, and that's not a surprise to us. So, can you help us think of a way that we can use this outreach to farmers where? They need the help immediately, and we have a, a desire to also strengthen the long-term ag economy. Um, you know, maybe it's an opportunity to use um, the application as a survey that could provide some useful data that you know has a little life down in the coming year that's used by folks uh, in the work you're doing, or uh, just help us think about this because let's face it, able to get money as a, a relief for, uh, for farmers, we have an opportunity to be a little bit creative about the application so that we get some, I, I, I'm really interested, I'll say it this way, in a, also having some long-term uh, value here in in addition to short-term relief and that's been tricky for us to figure out and you guys are the right people to ask and then you also have the um, the advantage from from our point of view of being the people that are executing this and so what are some things we should be watching for that's a very jumbled question but any any thoughts on that would be greatly appreciated hello do you want to take the first crack and I'll sure. follow up. Yeah. Um, so I I did watch some of your your discussion, not necessarily from earlier this week, but I have a, a bit of a concept of what you've been talking about, and um and appreciate. And I, I I just say that you know we run multiple grant programs through the viability program, uh, including water quality grants program supported by capital bill dollars, and but other grant programs that we've run over time. And there's it's often an opportunity to introduce folks at that same time to technical assistance opportunities that can both support their management of that grant money and seeing a project through, um, but also it's just a nice time to, to look at an at, when we're a sitting down and assessing an application. And like you said, you could have certain kind of information collected in that application that helps identify opportunities and needs to connect with different resources. And so we do that all the time when we're looking at grant applications saying, oh, we're going to not only you know respond about their grant but we're going to talk to them about our succession planning program because now we see that they're like you know at a certain age and they have are frustrated about not finding a successor and we can help so um we do a lot of that pairing not necessarily requiring the technical assistance with the grant because that usually causes problems of you know the volunteer nature of participating in a trust building a trust building exercise with a technical assistance person, but some kind of assessment or conversation usually is helpful to the person who's receiving a payment and, and most of the time gets followed up on. So we, we definitely see that as a, as a connecting opportunity. Um, and just to answer your question about capacity, I, I, when I responded, I wanna, I wanna say that we can ramp up capacity. We can ramp up capacity relatively quickly, I think, for some of the needs that we're seeing. Um, we can bring on consultants that right now do a handful of hours a week, but who have capacity right now, especially as other clients don't pick up projects that they thought they were gonna have, uh, they have more hours available to us if we, if we can fund them. So consulting is where we're immediately making, creating capacity, significant capacity. And uh, many of our partners are doing lots of work. Their teams are working really hard. And if there was some 
clear money for the next fiscal year or something, um, or even through the end of the year, they might be able to bring on a part-time or full-time staff to do a specific activity. We often hire retired farmers for certain kinds of uh, consulting because they really know what they're doing and they, they might have <clears throat> There's multiple ways we can find the capacity. Can we bring on 17 FTEs by the end of the fiscal year? No that with the right level of expertise that we just talked about, no, but we could definitely increase capacity rather quickly on some fronts. So just, just to say that there's a balance there. Um, so, you know, and like I expressed, you know, if we do fewer, you know, projects where the client is using up 40 hours of consultant time and, and instead help eight uh, businesses with five hours of consulting time, that's a way we're definitely expanding our ability to meet the needs of the current crisis. Um, Plus, you must have already a, a vast mailing list of clients that, uh, you know, you could contact and, and put out, put literature out there that you're there to help and, and, um, and move forward with. So, um, yeah, you've got the expertise, I think, on board to do what we've been talking about. Um, the, uh, I don't, uh, I guess we could add something like your, your thing to our application, the way you do it, and have it referred right to BHCB uh, for, for, people that are filling out this application. If you want to contact uh, help for right away, you know, call VHCB and blah, blah, blah. But um, did that answer your question, Chris? Yeah, um, I would love, uh, you know, you guys, <laughs> Gus, you have a history of, innocently testifying in Senate Ag and having new programs erupt. Um, uh, you know, I, I'll just say from where I'm sitting, uh, I've been looking forward to hearing from you guys. And I think that to the extent uh, we can loop this in with this food security COVID relief, get you some extra capacity. We want to, I want to do that. And so uh, help us think about the appropriate level of uh, getting that done because there is, as you say, a, a crisis opportunity here that our communities badly need, in, in my opinion. Uh, Rose? Yeah, thank you. So to, in thinking about what our bill has in it right now, and I don't know if you all have been able to, to take a look at the language because it hasn't been posted yet, but um, Senator Pearson referenced the sort of technical assistance thoughts that we had. And I, you know, I've been talking to lots of farmers over the last couple of weeks. And um, as I have quite a few of them here in my district and um, uh, wondering if maybe the better route to go is to, it, as part of the, you know, grant that they might receive through through the COVID relief to, to include some type of questionnaire about what their needs are. Instead of saying, you have to do this thing, we ask them, what, what do you need? Do you need anything? Maybe they don't. There are some really sophisticated um, dairy operations and farm operations that you know have their plan together and probably don't need help, except for financial help, obviously, um, but don't need technical assistance. And then there are others who may need something really specialized that you're not able to provide. Um, and so maybe the better route is to just put in, you know, sort of in the envelope with the check, here's the survey that we want you to fill out um, or something like that. But I'm wondering if that's already been done, first of all. Um, but so I don't want to duplicate anything and create more work for anybody, but would that be helpful? Um, because I agree, I think asking and starting the conversation rather than making that requiring them to do something that's not helpful or not necessary is, is a better route to go. Um, and uh, I had another question, but now it's just completely well, in my mind. So Ruth, why don't I, I don't, Ruth, I don't think we ever had it in a bill that that they had to do this. Um, 
I, I don't recall. I, we may have chatted about that, but it, I don't think it was ever the committee's um, determination that we were going to absolutely require somebody to do this subject to receiving the grant. It just got misstrewed and, and spread all over something. Um, right. I, the, I think part of our conversation was what, what would be the most helpful. And yeah. you know, there was discussions about technical assistance. So I'm just wondering yeah. if some kind of survey questionnaire would be, would be helpful or, uh, or if that's something you've already done. Yeah, Gus, uh, what? Ella, go ahead and then I'll jump in. Well, I was just going to ask if it might be helpful for you to look at our rapid response intake form, which may, may be basically that exact same thing. Yeah. So whether you either use the same form or the same idea, or you point people to just saying, please fill this out in, in addition, and the HCV will match you with resources. Um, so can I put this in the chat box? Would that be helpful? Or using the ch chat feature on Zoom? Uh, I think it would be, could you email it to us? Yeah. Sure. And maybe Michael should get it, or Michael already has a copy of that. I don't. I don't think I do. So you could could you ship one to Michael, uh, Ella? Yeah, and to Linda. Yes. I I did think of my other question, which was when you find that you have holes in your capacity or expertise, uh, are you working with regional partners? Um, with with people in other states who may have the expertise. Um, I, I've heard from several dairy farmers that there's you know considerable expertise in New York because they have a, a lot of dairy in New York and wondering if if you're working with those partners to fill in any holes that you may have. We do. We have several consultants from New York State that come over and do work with farms and forests, and particularly with uh, Steve Vick, who works with loggers. Um, and then uh, we've got folks from Deem Associates, which is a big um, uh, financial services firm based out of New York that works with dairy farmers, more larger operations. So we rarely contract with them, but when it's a good fit and a business isn't already using a service like that, we have contract with them before. So to some degree, I think um, sometimes we're po pointing people towards resources at Cornell or something like that, not necessarily contracting for them ourselves, but we have a, several consultants that we definitely pull from other states. And then we have a regional consortium of New England and Hudson Valley uh, business advising organizations that we're building a network with so that we can all learn from each other and, and share resources such as such as that. Um, Anthony? Yeah, moving away from dairy for a minute, I want to go back to something I think you said or I, that I heard you say earlier, and I just want to make sure I heard you right. T in terms of talking about um, helping farm, we have something in our bill a draft that help, intended to help non-dairy farmers adapt to changing conditions to regain some of the market demand that they've lost, whatnot. And we've talked about the examples being farmers who maybe need help setting up a farm stand on their farm or setting up a website for their farm so they could take advantage of new ways of marketing that they could pivot to the new ways of marketing because as we all know, you know, CSAs have become more popular and people are, who are doing online sales are doing really well, but not everybody's set up to do that. So we've put in our bill draft, I think, some money that would be used for grants to farmers to do things like farm stands and websites and other things like that. And, and also to me, it ties into the issues around hunger as well, food security, because we need to keep these farmers producing and expanding. So I think I heard you say that you already do that. I'm just, I'm just wanna make sure that I got the, I heard that right. We're talking about, we, we've been looking about it mostly in terms of grants to farmers, but I guess another option, I'm not saying I don't wanna do grants to farmers, but another option would be to support the work you're already doing, because it seems like you already do some of that stuff. Is that true? Yes, I think both are true. Grants and technical assistance often need to go hand in hand, but sometimes grants might overlap with technical assistance because we do pay and provide things around uh, marketing planning, marketing research, and uh, even branding and website development. 
uh, but our, our funds for that are limited. So, you know, a, a farmer might come to us, get some sort of coaching on that and, a cup, you know, and, and then maybe 10 hours of a firm's time helping them set up some of their new marketing and online sales, for example. Uh, Intervale in particular, as well as NOFA Vermont and the Center for Ag Economy, I think are all helping producers of all kinds, dairy and otherwise, who want to switch to on, more on-farm sales or online sales uh, and increase direct to consumer uh, sales there's a lot of that happening right now. An, an extra $5,000 grant to support of the website costs or um, the purchase of software for online sales, for example, can go a long way to, to support that. So I guess I wouldn't deter you from looking at grants for this kind of purpose, um, but it's nice to know that there's also a substantial amount of technical assistance through the viability network for that work already. Uh, and that so someone, someone, not that. To, I mean, someone might get a grant for a couple thousand dollars and then come to you folks to get the support they need to do whatever they're trying to fund. Yes, I think they go hand in hand really well. And I know the Working Lands Enterprise Board, I, I sit on that in Gus's stead, um, is also doing with just a bit of funding that's remaining for the fiscal year is, um, is about to make awards similar with similar purposes, but not a ton of money. Uh, I'm sure right. it'll be very competitive. Thanks. I guess I would just go back to Senator Pearson's question and just say that um, from my experience, both with our development rights program and our viability program, a key feature, and I understand the committee's uh, discussion has been taken in a way that nobody intended, has been always willing buyer, willing seller. Somebody wants to make a change and we support them in that change or improvement in their businesses. And um, one of Senator Hardy's constituents said to me quite a long time ago when we were first beginning our work back in the late 80s, early 90s, the way to work with the farm community, education, incentives, compensation. Um, and those things I've found are continue to be true. Having said all that, there are the realities of 11 and $12 milk is going to make some people think, that especially those who are near retirement anyway, I want a graceful exit and we are gonna have a landscape that continues to be, I think at risk in terms of its use for ag production. Um, and, uh, and I also think, and this goes back to the joint hearing you had, we will have an opportunity in the coming years and I know the state is gonna be strapped in terms of resources to bring in federal dollars that can be used to buy down the cost of those farms and get the next generation on the farm. And that will continue to be an important part of our work. And uh, I know Nancy Everhart's been, um, is with us this morning and <laughs> if we could just give her a few minutes just to talk about that. And Ella, I'm sure will also chime in, but we had farmland access work to do before this crisis hit. I'm sure it will discourage some people who will just want a graceful exit and we'll have some opportunities ahead of us to help get the next generation on the farm uh, in the not too distant future. Welcome, Nancy. Good to see you. Good morning. Um, I will, uh, nice to be with you all and to see you. My internet is not wonderful where I live and particularly this morning, so um, I'll see how this works. I may have to go back to, it seems to work a little better when I'm not sharing the video, but we'll, so you'll have to let me know if you, if I freeze up or if you can't hear me. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, Gus said at the beginning, this, this pandemic has really kind of, I think highlighted for all of us, the importance of food. I mean, it's such a basic necessity and we know Vermonters right now, some of them are having trouble accessing just enough for them and their families to eat. We're all like sort of shopping in a different way and thinking about food differently. And, you know, I'm so grateful that to live in a state where we have a, we've all done together so much work on building a strong network and a strong food system. Um, but there's obviously a lot more that we need to do. And the most, you know, foundational thing to growing food obviously is the land that Gus was just speaking about. And, you know, we are a leading state in the farmland protection we've done with your support for more than 30 years. You know, we've protected, uh, you know, about 20% of our farmland, about 14% of that's with or so with VHUB funding. So that's awesome, but that means there's, you know, 80% that is 
at risk at a time when we know there's going to be a lot of transitions of farms. And so, you know, it's it's the long term view that um, we've had for so for so long, and it 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 takes a lot of effort and work, and it's sort of project by project, but. Um, it is one of the most compelling ways we can help either dairies exit or transfer to the next generation or to a new form of production or new farmers um, get on the land. And you know, over half of the projects that we're funding with the sale of development rights are to, to uh, facilitate some sort of transfer. And we're also really lucky that when we're doing that, you know, through the viability program and this really strong and collaborative network we have in Vermont, we can not only help farmers access land, but they get the support and the technical assistance that Ella has been talking about, you know, to help, you know, help a, a new business get off to a good start or grow, um, you know, get the financial planning that they need. Um, and I think, you know, it's important to think about where we're kind of Vermont is the breadbasket of New England, really. There's a New England food vision that you've probably heard about, you know, 50% by 2060. And to accomplish that vision in New England, we would need to not only keep all the land we already have in farming, we'd have to add 2 million acres. And I, you know, I think that <laughs> seems like a, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would be a, a, a tall order right now for us. But you know, I think there's never been a time when, when I have been more appreciative of having local food, having a freezer full of my own beef, or you know, a lot of people want to grow more garden. So it's, you know it's not just about Vermont, we really supply a lot of food to the region and those have always been really important and strong markets for us. And we know the demand is really, you know, surging in the last month or two there as well. And, and we have a very strong pipeline right now. The demand to sell development rights is, is really high. We, we've got seven applications right now on hand. You know, we've spent all our FY20 money. We're gonna, we have a board meeting on Friday and we're gonna take three of those projects forward with a very conditional commitment of funds is these projects take a very long time to develop. It's complicated to sell real estate and to get contracts between, you know, and most of our projects, it's not just a contract to sell the easement, it's also to sell the land. Um, and we have, as Gus said, we, you know, if we, the seven projects we have on hand, the requests are 1.35 million of just state dollars but that would leverage 1.6 million of federal and other dollars. So we have a really great track record of leveraging federal dollars for this work. And while there's maybe some uncertainty around state dollars now, right now there is robust money at the federal level to conserve farms. You know, we're in the process of applying, right now there's 3.5 million that we know we can get in Vermont in federal FY20 dollars, but we have to match at 50%. That is our challenge. Um, and we, yeah, so I wanted to just mention like one of the projects, well, one other thing that I know Gus has also mentioned is when we're conserving farmland, we're, we're really taking a holistic view at the um, resource and we're really thinking about enhancing water quality. Um, we, the Ag Agency does a site visit on every farm we're conserving to, you know, make sure the farm is in good standing. If there's issues, we are bringing technical assistance to the farm might be through NRCS or through the BMP program at the Ag Agency or something to make improvements that are needed. You know, there's often a connection, especially when it's a transfer with the viability program. So it, it's kind of a, a big picture view of how we can not just protect the farm, but also sort of bring it to the next level in terms of the operation, but also in terms of the, uh, the environmental protection. So we're including surface water protections, um, riparian buffers or wetland protection zones that are permanent when we're protecting farmland. So we're, you know, we're also making real headway on water quality while we're keeping good land and agriculture. And uh, one example, you know, I did my first and only site visit since we went, virtu went virtual um, to, by myself, <laughs> a week ago to a farm in Fletcher, which is one of the ones that's coming to our board this week. You know, it's a beautiful property, the King Dairy that the family has owned for a long time, but they stopped milking in 2006. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. And, um, and it's been hayed and it's very scenic. And there is a, um, you know, relatively small operation boneyard farm that Hannah Doyle, with support from her husband, um, have on a homestead in Bakersfield. 
which is not too far from here. And so they, they now have a contract with the King family to buy the property and move there, move their family, move their operation there. They'll have so much more room to grow. Uh, but you know, the, it won't be affordable without being able to sell an easement. And so that's the exa an example of the kind of projects that we're doing. Uh, you know, Hannah Doyle's got a strong business plan. She's working with the Intervale Center. Um, I didn't meet her in person because of COVID, but I had a great phone conversation with her. She said, you know, yeah. demand is surging. They, they grow pork and chicken and veggies and they're, um, so in some ways, a, a silver, this is a time as you know, where, and it's an opportunity for some businesses to take advantage of the way the markets and consumer demand is changing and grow. And um, we just hope that we can, you know, be there to provide that sort of wraparound support uh, that we've been talking about. Uh, and that particular easement, you know, that farm's a good example. There's some tributaries on the Lamoille. It's like 7,000 feet. They'll all have 50 foot permanent buffers. Um, so we're, we're able to sort of get a big bang for our buck when we're, we're protecting farmland and helping these new businesses. Um, yeah, maybe I will just leave it there for now. Hopefully you could hear me okay and I didn't freeze up and <laughs> see if there's any questions. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Nancy. Um, um, sounds like even though you have to work solo in virtual, <laughs> uh, you're still getting quite a lot done, uh, which is great. Um, Absolutely. So you're going to, you need like three and a half million to, to match. We, we ought to get these numbers in some kind of an order. So we can, you know, go to the right places to try to get some. Um, Gus, you needed some earlier. You talked about uh, the Ready program. Um, yeah, I'll I'll let Ella just speak to that um, because she and her staff manage it. I think she's got a one pager that we've sent to the to Linda, um, or maybe it's a two pager um, on that as well. And I, I'm happy. Mr. Chairman, to just give you a memo that will outline, you know, the financial impact of or the financial cost of each of these things, and which ones yep. are clearly COVID related and which are just going to be issues as you wrestle with the state budget. Yeah. Um, but but uh, one other thing I just want to emphasize in terms of the state budget, because I know the plan is for a skinny budget, is, you know, we usually, we usually have the we're 400 short and that, those aren't dollars. They got an M after them that we know of. So, uh, but um, go ahead and finish. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, I know we're gonna do a budget for the first quarter of the year. Usually in the first quarter of the year, we make commitments for just about our full allocation of funding for the whole year. And most farmers who are seeking to sell an easement and farmers who want to get on the land, as Nancy just described, have been in the process. They're, this isn't something that started 90 days before we act on it. It's usually a year or, or longer in the making. So any, any delays, further delays in that um, are problematic for both the seller and the buyer. Um, yeah. but, but maybe, uh, just to finish up uh, our time with you today, um, Ella can talk a little bit about where the Ready program is. Well, and there may be some questions for Nancy too. Uh, that I kind of jump back uh, to a different uh, subject. Are there questions, uh, you know, pertaining to Nancy's testimony? No. Okay, so we'll go to Ella. Just gratitude. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot, all of you. Uh, Ella? Sure, um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna start just by underscoring what Nancy said and just talk, just saying that we were anticipating a threefold increase in succession projects within the viability program and, and the conservation program over the next three years. And were concerned about those projects. You know, I think that's what you just heard, but just, just saying we were all working towards ramping up the rate of uh, assisting in, it, whether it's with the conservation tools, the viability tools, we're often both um, helping those, those farmland succession projects 
be successful. And that, you know, it's just, it's a big area that we're really concerned about. We're going to still keep working on it. And, and like Nancy and Gus said, sometimes that just, this just prolongs the time, but it also backs up our pipeline on the conservation side really seriously. And it can put some of those farm, farmland at risk. So, um, you know, you all know that, but I just want to say just, just there's, there's a lot of folks who are working on the succession work from the Intervale Center to VLT to VHCB and, and beyond. Can I just Chris. ask a, a clarifying question, Ella? You all were anticipating a tripling, I think, is what you just said, in the next several years. What uh, there? I'm going to guess in the next three years, no one on the appropriations committees promised to triple your budgets. So, so can you just help me understand how state funds uh, are involved there? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I know that for the Vermont Land Trust, they Nick will say they did about a hundred projects that related to to succession ownership transition over the past ten years, and they anticipate doing about a hundred over the next three years. Um, they've raised some funds to make some of those projects more workable, it, it, particularly when the uh, VLT may need to hold the land in their ownership long enough to get it conserved, and then have have a the oncoming owner have the capacity and financial capacity to, to, to purchase the property. Um, but also, uh, Nancy will tell you that, uh, but I'll tell you in her words, uh, that more and more percentage, higher and higher percentage of VHCB conservation dollars have been going, or farmland conservation dollars have been going to situations that, that are a transition. So where maybe, you know, 10 or 20% years ago were farmland transitions, now it's close to, it's about 50, about half of our conservation projects are succession, are facilitating a, a, a tra ownership transition. And similar on the viability front, where we used to do like 10% of our uh, projects within the viability long-term business planning projects were transfer plans. Now it's about a third and, and, and growing. So we're using a higher portion. The need is shifting and more and more projects that come to us are around succession. And we're trying to raise more funding. We had a three-year USDA um, uh, project that will end this coming fall that supported uh, probably about a one and a half FTEs between the Intervale Center and, and the Vermont Land Trust. And we're gonna lose that funding, but we've already applied for another three years from the FRDP USDA program. And we're looking at other resources, including EDA and other federal resources. So we are also seeking increased resources to do that. Um, and talking with Allison Eastman at the agency about how we can increase the viability capacity over time with any state funds. So it's an ongoing conversation with state and local, uh, state and federal partners. Yep. Any other questions on uh, farmland uh, conservation? Uh, Rose? Yeah, thanks. Um, I actually have a question back. I, I looked at the survey that um, you sent. Um, and um, it's 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 good and everything, but it's very immediate. It's about what do you need right now? And I think a lot of our conversations were what do you what do farmers need moving out of this crisis and into um, making sure that their business is more resilient and sustainable for the longer term post COVID, whenever the heck post COVID may be. So my concern with, I mean, I think what you did right now is absolutely right for this moment in time, but I think based on my understanding of our conversations, we were looking much more toward, you know, the, the long, longer term or at least the middle term. Um, so wondering if that's that gathering that type of information so we know moving forward out of this crisis, what people are going to need would be helpful. Yeah, that makes sense. I think, you know, a lot of us in the technical assistance world really talk about sort of immediate response work and then recovery work and recovery, asking questions about recovery period is like you're saying, it's a longer term perspective, could be months, could be years for some businesses. So, um, uh, yeah, we, we could easily, we will need to adapt our program over the coming month to look more at the recovery uh, period. So we could work on a format, a form that a version of this that was aimed at that longer period and get that to you if that's helpful so that we could coordinate on that or just depending on where you go with the work that you're doing, we're happy to partner on that. Yeah, I think that may be helpful just to 
for us to be able to say, you know, here are some resources, uh, fill out this survey so we understand your recovery needs so that our ag sector, food forest sector is more resilient moving out of this. I, th I think that's the conversation, my understanding anyway, that we've been having. And so looking toward the future a little bit more, obviously we have to focus on the here and the now right now, but looking toward the future, what can we do and what will the needs be? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Just to, you know, in the next question. Day. Did somebody ask a question? No. Um, anything else, uh, committee, for for any of the VHCB crew? Well, I was going to give a quick overview on the Ready program for you. Yeah. Uh, no, go go for it. Thanks. Sorry to because keep you. That's, um, that's I, a pretty um, pretty positive deal. Uh, so uh, tell us uh, about it. Uh, Ella. Great. And um, I mean, this has been a really great program to run. Thank you for creating it and and giving and, you know, creating this opportunity for VHCB to, to get more involved in community and economic development projects with municipalities and businesses and rural communities. It's, it's, it's been a really feel good program because it's been very successful. And a lot of folks have identified, yes, this was a gap and this was a real need to have help with these kinds of federal and other kinds of complex applications when they're small municipalities or small businesses and don't necessarily have the capacity or understanding of the um, resources that are out there. So, you know, the short story is, like you said earlier, with $75,000 a year, we've been helping, you know, about a dozen businesses or communities um, apply for some really a, a broad range of important projects for those communities. And, Sometimes it's been a small town that just doesn't have the capacity and didn't, it doesn't have enough hours on staff to really work on an application, but bringing, on, bringing in some federal dollars for a trail project or a downtown project is gonna make a big difference. Um, when we've been leveraging, uh, it's leveraged the last, in the middle of our third year at this point, we've secured over three and a half million dollars in grant funding for, a, I think something like 25 to 30 projects. So that's been really successful. Um, on average, I think the projects have resulted in about $205,000 on average for each project. And, um, and right now we're seeing a shift in our ready work to some COVID related activities, particularly looking at uh, resilience, community economic resilience projects, uh, looking at broadband access, um, looking at adult education programs that different communities want to explore. We're helping some rural downtown retailers look at for looking for funding for sort of COVID, post-COVID um, recovery work and assisting farmers with applying to, for federal funds to help scale up or change markets, particularly through the value-added producer grant program at USDA Rural Development. Um, we would be interested in, in investing in this program if there was more funding for it. So the memo that we sent over to Linda yesterday afternoon uh, is a two page description of what we could do if we had $200,000 for a fiscal year and we would really double the impact but also be able to provide a, a wider variety of assistance to particularly municipalities and community projects, uh, including do, developing fundraising plans, not just applying for funds and doing a lot more education and outreach so that we could provide some base level um, uh, education and assistance around what are the resources that are out there that are available for different kinds of community and economic development projects. We think with the $200,000 investment annually, we could be seeing four to $5 million of resources secured for projects on an annual basis. So that's a really short overview. You have um, both that two pager memo from, from VHCB as well as um, a two-page annual report that was submitted to you in January um, about the past work that we've been doing and it includes a list of the projects from this past year. Yeah, I don't think Linda has sent that out to us uh, as of yet. <clears throat> um, uh, so, you know, we, we haven't, or I didn't see it. Did any of the rest of you get a copy of that? It's on our webpage, I believe, Bobby. 
Pardon? It's on our web page. Oh, well, I'm lucky to get on my iPad, so I Not I making don't. a judgment, just saying. <laughs> Your iPad can use the web page, by the way. Yeah. Well, boy, you know, you're never too old to learn, right? <laughs> um, so uh, thanks a lot for that, Ella. Are there questions for, for Ella in regards to uh, the Ready program? And, you know, as we move into the next fiscal year, we're going to need all these little where we can make a small appropriation, but make it so it'll generate a lot of extra money for for everybody in Vermont uh, to uh, take advantage of. And there's not too often we get a deal where you can spend a couple couple three hundred thousand and generate four or five million. So uh, in the communities, they take that money that get it. Uh, spend it, put, keep people working. Um, you know, those guys at ACCD should be funding. We should take a little bit of their money and put it into this because they're the ones that are supposed to be doing all this. Uh, and they, you know, I'm sure they work as hard as they can, but um, it takes uh, many hands to get all the jobs done. Um, so anyways, is there anything else, uh, any other questions? Um, if, if not, uh, I wanna thank you Gus and, and uh, hopefully you, you send a note off to, uh, to Jane. And you know, if, if we had a list of, of these different little pots of money that you need and you could use and what it, you know, just a short one liner, what it would be for and, and get that to, uh, to over to a probes that would, I think it would be most helpful. Uh, Senator, I will have something uh, in your hands and in Jane's tomorrow uh, on that subject. It'll be very brief. Um, yeah. I just do want to, as you leave, uh, put an exclamation point on uh, Ella's comments about Ready and remind you that that is a program that's for towns of 5,000 or less. So to the extent that you've been focused on rural communities, that's whom we're serving through it. And the last thing I just wanted to mention, which we've talked about in the past, um, whenever you get to a house, get to an, uh, an ag uh, housekeeping bill, uh, is that we're looking for a slight change in our statute just that will make us eligible as a nonprofit for a couple federal programs we're not currently eligible to apply for. And I think oh. you suggested that we work with Mike O'Grady on that and we'll continue yeah. to do and that. That that should be coming our way. I think if it didn't get moved yesterday i think by by the end of the week it should be coming over we, we right? just got an email that it's been released or it's about to be released to us and also that our soil amendment bill will advance yeah. thank you all very much today for your time and please if yeah. there are other questions shoot them off to us and uh we appreciate your thoughts we we learn from you and we know how close you are to your constituents and uh, really appreciate your um, insight about how we can make our programs better, especially in this difficult time. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And uh, we'll, we'll stay in touch. Um, okay. Well, um, so uh, back on to our covert uh, farming Ag enhancement uh, bill. Um, so, uh, what uh, you know, that was a good discussion in regards to uh, our our thoughts in in helping not only farmers of today but moving our ag sector uh, forward. Um, so, what what are your 
have you had any you had any thoughts while we were talking about this on where where you felt we should be going? I know we we've got to change directions from what people anticipated where we were going. I don't know how they read our minds like that, but uh, but anyways, um, uh, you know the the war isn't isn't over. We just you know got a battle here and a battle there, and and uh, but I think I think we've you know come to a little bit of a census on where we where we know where we want to get to is just how we're going to get there. And uh, Ruth had a suggestion of doing, uh, you know, a little survey or having a, a fill out paper. Uh, I don't know, any of you have other ideas and, and, uh, and do we need to load that in? I think it's probably a good idea to have something in that envelope uh, to help. I mean, this is to help people. I mean, it isn't to try to change anybody or force them or anything like that. So, um, so what, do you, what do you guys think? Well, it, it strikes me that those guys are doing a lot of the work that we're sort of wanting more of um, and so, uh, you know, some of this planning work, uh, I, I, I think the idea of a survey um, or some kind of uh, part of the application of, of getting some measurement of where people are at makes a lot of sense and is, is maybe would come across as less directive, uh, which none of us were trying to be directive. We were trying to understand and and protect sort of the the public investment we're considering right here into the future i think um but it, it, i really am struck uh, and i think for me the strategy across the board with our covid reaction is is uh, enhancing programs that are proven to work already um doing you know in the in the region that we're wanting and needing more of, Michael tells me some of the the planning reaction, uh, the discussion we're having today could well be COVID funds eligible, um, not the land acquisition obviously, but some of those micro grants, some of the planning and the capacity work. So to me, I, I would um, pivot just a little bit on the dairy money. And I would also try to, to lump um, more funding for the relief work that, that Ella was describing and put that right in the package, if, I think, or that's the first reaction I have. Well, I, I kind of like round numbers. Um, you know, these odd numbers, it's a lot easier if they're rounded up. Uh, Brian? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm looking at the draft and on page three, I think it's page three. Yeah, page three lines eight through 10, I would like to see deleted. This is the one that I think some people could read that as making a string attached to getting the, uh, the grant. And I don't, I don't think we want to do that. Um, Michael had it in in blue, I think. Was it blue or, or yellow? It was blue. Yeah, well, you guys, you guys have a colored printer. Okay. My, what line, what sections are you talking about, Brian? This what is in e? section, no, I have e? to go back up. Section it's, one. Right. And it's on page three. Um, okay. Lines eight, nine, and 10. I think we all agreed that the farm should be actively producing milk and be in good standing with both the agency of uh, ag and uh, natural resources. Yeah. But 
I think the, the one right after that is the one that caused some concern with people that they had to agree to have people come on and kind of have a survey done and all that sort of stuff in order to get the money. So that's just my thought. I, I think if we just delete it, we can reword it, but I would uh, I would not like to see that in there because I think that that puts a string on the on the grant. So, so that that's the language that I had said. Let's put a pin in that and get back to it because I was exactly. uncomfortable with it as well. Um, exactly. Yeah, and I I would agree with. Brian, and this was what I was talking about in terms of, do we wanna instead say, hey, here are some resources, here's a questionnaire so we understand what your needs are. Here, you know, here are some opportunities for you to, if you need assistance um, and, and really put it more as a conversation, access to resources. Um, and that's why what I was talking with Ella, trying to get them to think about a survey forward looking, uh, in the medium term kind of thing. But that isn't that section two that we're on, that you're on, Brian? Or no, it's it's section it's section one and two because section two is yeah. that response team and section one has that as a condition of in order to qualify for assistance, you have to yeah. agree to allow within 18 months uh, a farm feasibility assessment assessment to be conducted by the response team. Is so it, under, it is. Is that under B, Michael? Section? Yes. Yes. Okay. So B would be would be struck. How far? Well, I, I think you still want them to be in good standing. Yeah. I think you still want them to be actively producing milk. Yeah. And then if you want to incorporate Senator Hardy's uh, recommendation, you could replace the farm feasibility assessment with they shall complete some survey. I don't know if you want to use the VHCB survey or if you want a different survey regarding um, their um, the pressures that they're facing or the needs that they need assistance with or services um, well, or, I, uh, and, and information about how to access that. I think it would be wise to take VHCB's language that they've already developed, maybe add, if, if you folks, the committee thinks we should add a a few other things to it. And we ought to even list uh, VHCB's farm viability program and their phone number so that if people feel comfortable and need feel they need to call, uh, they'll have the info. Um, Ruth or Chris, I didn't see which one had their hands up first. Ladies before gents, Chris. Um, thank, thank you. I got that advantage on this committee. Um, uh, I'm wondering if we might want to actually, instead of making filling out a survey a uh, requirement for the recipient, that we instead make creating a survey and a list of resources, et cetera, as a requirement for the ag agency to include in the the information that the farmer gets with the check. And, and I also am thinking that we might wanna do this the same for the other program we're thinking about, the, the one, the non-dairy program. So all farmers get the same you know, information and resources and survey or whatever, um, saying that the ag agency has to work with VHCB or work with farm to plate or work with whomever. Because the, the other thought I had was farm to plate may already have something in the bag for this kind of thing too. Um, not reinventing the wheel, but. Well, aren't you, aren't you gonna make it a requirement again if you do it that way? I would make it voluntary, but I wouldn't put any strings attached. Oh no, nope. require the agency to create one or have one that's included and make it voluntary for the farmer to fill it out or whatever. That's what I was. Okay. Um, now it's gentlemen's it, time. Um, 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, what'd you say? Whose time is it? It's it's gentleman time now. Uh, we had. <laughs> by the way, we got a Senate all caucus yeah. in fourteen minutes. Yeah, if we could have a few minutes break, I'm sure yep. we'd all be grateful. But I, yeah. it strikes me there's a few different things. I I think we clearly want to have uh, information. So you you get some kind of application because you you indicate you want it as a farmer. In there, you would get a list of resources. But I do think that the application, you know, you're going to have to have some kind of application. And I think in there, you do want a survey that it could be, you know, based on, I haven't looked yet at what we were just sent this morning, but it would be sort of, do you have a, a succession plan, uh, you know, or, or depending on where you're at in the farm's life, is there a succession plan? Are you interested in uh, working with people that do this, you know, some of those basic informations, just think about it this way, rather than us compelling that they have this meeting, we at least come back with the information of here's the hundred farms that are interested in the meeting that we were all talking about a week ago. That to me, that this is not onerous. This is, you put this next to the name of the farm and the address and, you know, five to 10 questions about, um, you know, the, the future of ag. Here's, here's where I come from on this. There are people who will rightly say ag has been, dairy has been struggling for 30 years and you guys are taking public dollars and helping them out yet again. That there, there is a reasonable question that people are asking there. And so I just want to be able to say dairy is important to Vermont. And here's where we are recognizing some of the volatility in that economy and our attempt to shore it up and to have a robust ag sector for decades to come because we are investing public dollars right now. In I don't want to interrupt your train of thought, but that would be the way to start this off. You know, we're not requiring you. We're here to try to help you and Here's a few, you know, questions yeah. that we need to hear the answers on. Would you please uh, That's right. uh, fill this out and be positive about it and not not Absolutely. say? I think that's. What about you guys? Could you eat, go for that? Sure. It still I mean, feels like a requirement to me. But. Well, well, I think that if it's part of the application process, I, I don't have a problem with that. I think, you know, it's, it's you know, five to 10 questions on a survey um, just to sort of assess what the needs may be. I, I mean, if we're sending them a check for $50,000, it doesn't seem like that's too onerous. And, and really, I think what's important is getting the information about what do people, what do farmers need and that would maybe help guide us in what we might do next with right. funding. I don't, I don't right. see. It's, it's a way of helping avoid problems in the future by better preparing than we were in right now. I think that we can make this into something that would be positive and not a requirement. You know, would you please fill this out, uh, be polite about it. And, you know, it maybe, Maybe we'll get some fill it out. Uh, if somebody feels they're hunky dory and things are rosy and and life is great, uh, uh, then they may not fill it out. Uh, but I mean, it would be great information for us and Gus and and even the ag agency should have to know where we need to go. Uh, you know, we're not milking cows every day or growing veggies, so we we don't know all the ins and outs and where always where we might be able to help. Um, I, I'd, I'd love to hear from the people who think everything's hunky-dory, by the way. <laughs> well, well, we'll know. We'll know if they fill out the survey. <laughs> and if it, they and think they're fine. Um, I... We, we could definitely have that as an option, hunky dory. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new term, huh, Ruth? 
Um, any anything <laughs> else? We got ten minutes. Um, yeah, I'd like to see a man about a horse before they yeah four uh, minutes. Talk to so. Like, you're into equines and um, yeah. Okay. Okay, I, I would just I would just like to say for very briefly that we have not really talked about including any of the hunger programs and what we put together so far, and I think we should at least we mentioned food insecurity all the, while we're talking about it. But the bill itself but doesn't really mention any of those things. So we just want to consider that. We're going to have another bill that we're going to want to move forward. And so I'd, I'd like to get this dairy stuff kind of tied down so we could get it into that supplemental budget and they might get their money before snow flies. Um, you know, and, and so if we can get... I still think we ought to keep working on a bill to advance either on its own or add it to the miscellaneous uh, bill that we're going to have coming our way uh, on food security and 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 the uh, all that good stuff. I would like to continue with this full package, at least the first three items. The the dairy piece, the non-dairy piece, and the migrant farm worker piece as one package. And I think we're really close on all that language. And it would just a matter of us getting half an hour with Michael to, to get it final. Yeah, uh, maybe hopefully Friday, we could take some of that time just for the committee. Um, oh, let's see, where's my schedule here? Um, we're on at 10.30. On Friday. Yeah, because I, well, if we aren't going to do floor time or you guys don't have a side meeting, we might be able to start that a little bit earlier. That would work. Would that work for you guys? Yeah. Yep. I, think, um, I, think, I do think we have bills on the floor, but uh, but they may not be beefy. I don't know. Yeah. On Friday? And, and Ruth. Uh, on Friday, though, you think? No, I don't think so. No, no, I thought you guys had GovOps. Anyway, we'll find out more in the all Senate call in, in five minutes. Yeah. Um, minutes. Ruth, uh, be thinking about your migrant worker bill because that's a half a million general fund, right? Yeah. So I, I, I don't know what, you, if you've talked to Jane, what the situation is. So um, it's rough. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Yeah. Uh, Michael? So I just wanted to note in California, they turned that program into a public private partnership so that they use the state funds to leverage down private funds to, to pay for a good percentage of it. So if you're concerned about getting money from the general fund, maybe you turn that into a public private partnership where you create a fund, you put some state money into it, but then you allow private entities to, to contribute to it in order to provide assistance um, to farm workers. It was the California was $500 per, per person too, it right? It was, yeah. yeah. You wanna have, have Michael do a little draft up of that, Ruth, and see what it looks like or? Yeah, Michael, if you have ideas for that, I'm, I, I don't know that we'll, we'd be able to leverage that kind of money here in Vermont because we're so, so tiny, but I don't. So I, I would do it like I did the GMO food fight fund where you just put money into it and then you allow people to donate into it. You don't say that there's going to be a specific amount that's going to come from private funding. You just allow for the private funding to go into it. And then the program gets to spend up to whatever's available in, in the fund. So you may not be getting the money out to, to the full universe of eligible applicants, but you're basically leveraging some private funding in order to, to run the program. Uh, let me think about it and see, let me ask a few people what their thoughts in terms of the, the viability of making that happen. If it's sure. the only option we have, then I'm, I'd am i rather have something than nothing, but let, let me think about it and then I'll okay. let you know. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, you're we catching on, Rose. <laughs> that's, that's a way. <laughs> that's a I way. Gotta go. Can want. we leave it? Can we leave it there for now? Yeah. 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 yeah we've got. See you on the floor or in the caucus. Yeah. So thanks a lot, guys. I think we had a good meeting.
For sure. Thanks, Bob.